Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Women's State of Play in 2022 programs about supporting caregivers. I'm Jordan Brooks. I'm the executive director of the United State of Women. I use she, her pronouns, and I am so thrilled to be here today in partnership with our friends at SIX and the Supermajority Education Fund, as well as our partners um, in states and cities across the country doing really extraordinary work. And it is my pleasure to really be here to kick us off today. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. The event is today is being recorded. Also, live captioning is available. If you just go to the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to get that live captioning um, right away. If you have any questions at all, please submit them to us using the Q&A function on your um, chat function, which you can submit questions um, for our, our incredible state legislators when we get to that point in the program. But really, we're just so excited to be here with you today. So thank you so much for joining us. Continue, people are continuing to join as we move um, through the program right now, but we're really excited to hear from all of our great state legislators who are doing really extraordinary work across the country and also our special guest. Um, so I wanna quickly just, what we like to do here at United State of Women and Supermajority and Six is really figuring out where people are coming here from. So tell us where you're here from. Um, what is your geographic location using the poll that we are about to launch? So we're gonna launch a quick poll question. Just tell us what region you're located in, where you're calling in from, um, what part of, the country you are here zooming in from tonight so we know where more of our um where, where we know all of our people are coming in from so we're, if you can just take a quick poll question and just be a quick second all right two more seconds to take that poll i'm coming i'm zooming in from actually from cape cod massachusetts Normally I'm in Washington DC, but I'm in Cape Cod, Massachusetts today. So I'm from the Northeast quadrant today. Um, poll team, what are our results? What are we hearing from people tonight? All right, so 55% of people are coming in from the Northeast. 10% of our people are joining from the South, 25% from the West and 10% from the Midwest. So we've got a pretty good geographic distribution here. Lots of people coming in from the Northeast. If you wanna join and put your um, your location and from and where you're calling in from in the chat, please do. Really excited um, to have people from all over the country here joining us today. So we're gonna do one more quick poll question before we kick it over to um, our friends who are gonna be talking about all of the exciting ways that we can be supporting caregivers right now. Um, tell us if you know your state legislator no, using the poll. Um, so no shame either way, we're here to help, um, to help you get connected to your state legislators, but do you know who your state legislator is? Absolutely, you're not sure, or no, where can I find this information? We'll give you all that information. Our, um, our friends here can really help get all of the information to you so you can find out who your state legislator is, how you can support their work and how you can really make sure that we are um, really working across all levels of government to make sure we're supporting caregivers. So um, I will confess, I had to look up my state legislator using the, the work that we're doing here because I just moved. So it was really important for me um, to be able to use some of those resources we have here too. So um, just let us know, do you know who your state legislator is? Are you engaged with them? Are you not sure, which is totally okay. Or do you wanna know where you can find them? And Kelly, our friend from SIX, just put in how you can find your state legislator on the State Innovation Exchange website. Um, really great tool where you can go in and find your state legislator right away and how you can connect to them. So poll team, what does everybody say? The answer is 60% of the people absolutely know who your state legislator is. That is awesome. We're so glad you know who your state legislator is. That is really great. Some people aren't sure, that's totally okay. Just check out the State Innovation Fund uh, website and you can find out who your state legislator is right away. Um, lots of people are representing you across different local um, local elected uh, positions. And so we wanna make sure you know who all of those people are. And if you don't know, 20% of the people said they don't know, um, you can really go to that state innovation website right now and find out who your state legislator is. So that's a task we want you all to do as you are um, listening to our state legislators today. Make sure you go in, make sure you figure out who your state legislator is and how you can contact and work with them. Thank you guys all for taking those couple of polls so we can figure out where everybody is as we start this conversation. 
Um, and now it is my uh, really extreme pleasure to introduce a really good friend, a long, long, long time advocate for caregivers across the board. Um, someone who I will say, if, I, if someone were to ask me who my superhero was, uh, this woman is one of my superheroes um, and one of my um, organizing mentors in so many ways, um, Ai-jen Poo, who is I'm gonna read a little tiny bit of her bio, but it's really hard to um, talk about all of the amazing work that iGen has done. But iGen is an award-winning organizer, author, and a leading voice in the women's movement and in the gender equity movement, and is an, has been in a leading voice for caregivers for so many years. She's the president of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the director of Caring Across Generations, and she is also a co-founder of Supermajority, so one of our partners here tonight. She is the co-host of a, the Sunstorm podcast and the trustee of the Ford Foundation. iGen is a nationally recognized expert on elder and family care, the future of work, and what's at stake for women of color. She's the author of a celebrated book, The Age of Dignity, Preparing for the Elder Boom in a Changing America. And iGen is just all around one of the most, um, one of the best people to talk about these issues and somebody who can really help us to think about caregiving in particularly in the time we are in right now. So it is my honor to introduce you all to the extraordinary Ai-jen Poo. Ai-jen, take it away. Thank you so much, Jordan. What a sweet introduction. I just love the way that we as women lift each other up and you are one who has lifted so many of us up. Um, and thank you all for joining. I'm so excited that you are here. This is the most important conversation for us to be having right now. It's such a big moment for all of us who are caring for the people that we love. For so long, caregiving has been treated as a personal responsibility to be shouldered mostly by the women in our families. And if we're struggling for whatever reason, it's seen as a personal failure. Either we didn't save enough or we don't have the right job or we're a bad mom or bad daughter. And for the first time, the pandemic really laid bare for everyone in the country to see just how weak our caregiving systems are and how it's not our fault. We need a strong caregiving infrastructure to support us. And it's created a whole new awareness in the general public about how essential the care economy is, and it's helped to enable huge shifts at the federal level. So the Biden and Harris administration have made caregiving has made caregiving a core pillar of the economic agenda. And that is a huge breakthrough that has never really happened before that an administration would prioritize the care economy in an economic agenda, not the women's agenda, not the family or aging agenda, the economic agenda. And this administration announced a platform for economic success called Build Back Better that includes all three pillars of a strong care infrastructure, which we see as childcare, strong uh, childcare programs, affordable access to quality childcare for all, paid family and medical leave, another core pillar of a strong care infrastructure, and care for older adults and people with disabilities, especially in the home and community. That's the third pillar. And this, this approach is important because it's holistic. It's about what families need across generations. Advocates have been fighting for years for a, an approach that's been grounded in the reality that these programs are not interchangeable. They're all essential. We, are, we need care across the lifespan. Um, and, and a key part of this that's so important is the workforce. Um, and the federal economic agenda that includes the care agenda that the Biden-Harris administration has been promoting really prioritizes making jobs in child care and home care, living wage jobs with benefits, um, access to economic security and opportunity so that the caregivers who take care of us can take care of their families too. Huge. And so the House passed a bill back in November that included big investments in all three pillars of the care agenda. And now the Senate is considering budget reconciliation legislation that could lower care costs for families by investing big in childcare and home and community-based services, 
could be the biggest investment in the care economy for generations. So we've got to make sure that the Senate moves forward with this. We've got a few weeks to really make sure that that happens. So call your senators. But the fact that we're even talking about care at the federal level is because there's been years of work at the state and local level on paid family leave, on child care, on home and community-based services. All of this has paved the way, which is why today's conversation is so important. Back in 2003, for example, domestic workers held a convention in New York City and developed a vision for a New York State Domestic Workers Bill of Rights. 10 years later, New York became the first state in the country to pass a Bill of Rights for over 200,000 mostly women of color who work as nannies, house cleaners, and home care workers. Now 11 states have bills of rights that have been passed, and now there's a federal domestic workers bill of rights. That's how it happens. It's all connected, including the current devastating attacks on reproductive freedom and bodily autonomy. We live in a country where there's been forces on the far right that have building have been building and executing on a long term strategy to keep women in positions of vulnerability and abuse and undermine our ability to have agency autonomy to take care of ourselves and the people that we love and ultimately have power. And that's why it's so important that we're together and that we're here today and we're going to hear from some brilliant state legislators who I can't wait to hear from. Um, thank you for having me and thank you for being here with us today. Thank you so much, the brilliant Ai-Jen Poo. Hi, everybody. I'm Kelly Baden. She, hers. I'm with State Innovation Exchange, or Six. As you have heard, we are a resource and strategy center for state legislators to build power and advance bold progressive policies at the state level um, on everything from reproductive justice and voting rights to economic justice and so much more. So I am um, beyond thrilled to introduce you to four dynamic women state legislators who are going to share some of their own stories about caregiving, both from a state policy lens, but also how their own kind of caregiving story intersects with their role as an elected official. Um, we've got the Q&A function in there. You can start um, lining up any questions you might have for them and we'll have an opportunity after we hear from each of them um, to engage with some discussion. So first, please welcome Michigan State Senator Stephanie Chang. You might know her on Twitter as the hashtag mommy legislator, um, but she's a dynamic policy expert and um, caregiving expert. So Senator Chang, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, really, really pleased to be here uh, with the State Innovation Exchange, the Supermajority Education Fund in the United States of Women. Um, so um, my name is Stephanie Chang. I am currently a state senator here in Michigan, and I'm a mommy legislator. So when I first uh, took office back in January 2015. I started this job pregnant with my first daughter um, and then later became, uh, when I moved over to the Senate, uh, the first uh, woman's, the first senator to give birth while serving in the Michigan State Senate. Um, so, you know, that term mommy legislator is really because truly um, this whole journey over the past almost eight years of being, of learning how to be a public servant um, at the same time of learning how to be a mom uh, has been amazing and also challenging. Um, and so definitely I think that being a mom in the legislature of two young, amazing daughters um, has shaped a lot of the way that I serve, the policies that I introduce, uh, how I vote, and also the work that I do in the community. Um, so I wanted to actually start off by just saying um, one of the things that I love um, about this job of being a state lawmaker is that I get to be creative and come up with uh, fun things to do in the district and fun ways to serve my community. And I just remember, you know, after giving birth to my first daughter, um, really recognizing how much I was paying for all of these things for our babies. Um, and some of the stuff is really expensive. And I recognize very much my own privilege of being, you know, a middle class uh, 
uh, households where we can afford to pay for all of these basic items that our children need um, and realizing that you know I represent a district that has a high rate of poverty and many low income moms who may not have the ability to pay for all of the things um, that are needed and so um, one of the things that I decided I wanted to do was start a community baby shower. So uh, one of it's an event that I love. We've done it four times now. Um, and basically what it is, is an opportunity to serve. We've at this point served like hundreds of, of people um, by not just giving away baby items, um, but also providing uh, educational workshops at the baby shower around breastfeeding and infant CPR and safe sleep and positive parenting and um, doing all these great workshops um, and really connecting people with resources, which we hope will be a longer term um, help for those moms, um, in addition to, of course, a lot of fun baby items. Um, so I wanted to start off by just by mentioning that because, um, you know, as policymakers, uh, we also, our public servants are able to come up with creative ways to help serve our residents in our districts. Uh, but in addition to that, you know, one of the other first things that I did when I got to the legislature besides uh, having a baby uh, and uh, coming up with the baby shower was uh, introducing earned paid sick time legislation. Um, it literally my second month in office, um, I was so proud to introduce uh, earned paid sick time legislation um, in Michigan uh, that years later, unfortunately, got adopted and then amended um, by our Republican legislature um, that really weakened the law that originally was going to go to the ballot um, and that we know probably Michigan voters would have supported, um, but it got adopted in the legislature and then gutted. Um, and so we've got still a lot of work to do around earned paid sick time in Michigan um, because we know that there are still are 32 million people across this country, uh, more than one in four are private sector workers who can't even earn a, a single paid sick day. Um, and we know that this disproportionately impacts moms. And we know that this disproportionately impacts uh, women of color. And we know uh, that it should not matter uh, who you are or where you are. Um, no one should have to decide between uh, earning a paycheck and taking time off to take care of your sick baby or your or an elderly member of your family who needs help. Um, so we need to really make sure that we restore our earned paid sick time law in Michigan to what Michiganders really wanted to support and see on the ballot. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to mention is that um, you know, in Michigan, many of the things that we have been fighting for in terms of economic justice and caregiving policies have been an uphill battle. Uh, but one of the things that has been great over the past year or so has been uh, our leadership from our governor um, and Governor Gretchen Whitmer, who's been an incredible ally. And we have been able to do some good uh, policy through our budget. Um, so for example, in child care, uh, within our budget, we allocated $15 million for uh, barrier removal for starting up child care facilities, um, and then $2.5 million for a, a tri-share child care program, uh, which basically is this innovative program to allow employers, uh, the state, and the employees to actually all chip in to help uh, with child care. And it's a great model, uh, and we hope to be able to expand that. Um, and then we also, around elder care, uh, our governor has recommended $60 million for a nursing home non-direct care wage increase. Um, and we know that so many of our caregivers, our direct care workers are uh, vastly underpaid and we need to do better uh, for them. Um, and then just this week, our governor announced the Caring for Michigan Future Plan, uh, which is a bold, bold proposal to open 1,000 new child care programs by 2024. Uh, it's a plan that includes $100 million to help Michigan families find quality, affordable child care. Um, and we know that in Michigan, nearly half of Michigan's communities don't have enough child care options. And I hear that all the time from people in my district and across the state. Uh, so we've got a lot of work to do there. Um, there's so much more that I could say, um, but I just, you know, this is such an important to issue. And I really think that um, as, as was mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 pandemic really, really has highlighted how much work we need to do and just how important caregiving policies, whether it's earned paid sick time or quality affordable child care or elder care, all of these things that uh, are so essential 
uh, for um, moving our country in the right direction because we know that so many families have just really been struggling. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing the other panelists and uh, grateful to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Chang. I will make sure to drop your Twitter handle in the chat so folks can follow you online and keep track of your next community baby shower as well as all the great policies you are working for. Um, up next, we have um, my good friend and a friend of anybody who is devoted to justice in Arizona or beyond, Arizona State Representative Athena Selman, um, also a brand new mom and um, just all around champion and delighted to hear from you, Representative Selman. Yeah, thank you so much, Kelly, and, and thank you to all the hosting organizations as well for having me as a part of this very important and crucial webinar on, on this very important topic. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Representative Athena Salman. I represent the 26th District in the Arizona State Legislature. Uh, I gave birth the first week of the legislative session in the midst of uh, what was probably the worst um, wave of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, uh, at, at, not at the peak of the surge, but pretty much at part of the height end of the surge. Uh, and I think uh, my story is very, uh, very much exemplifies the condition and struggle that um, women and, and pregnant people are facing today and since the onset of COVID, um, even though I am vaccinated, I am boosted. Uh, I have many colleagues who are boosted, who are uh, in experiencing their fourth bout with COVID. And with my job uh, and with the my party not being the governing party, the governing majority, but a different party that I will let you all guess who that is, um, being the, the governing majority and controlling the rules of the chamber, even though we had remote voting options for the past two years um, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, just days before I was uh, due to give birth, uh, the Republicans, sorry, cats out of the bag, but the Republicans stripped those rules and demanded that I come in person um, at 40 weeks pregnant uh, and, and about to go into labor. So, and, and since then, it's pretty much been a standoff. I have um, stand, stood firm in my request and um, um, seeking accommodation so that now, not only do I not get COVID as someone who has asthma and has had to manage that my entire life ever since I was a young girl, um, but more importantly, that my unvaccinated daughter um, who is now four months old, who um, is not eligible for any vaccine. I am very much watching closely um, for a vaccine uh, that may, may come out this year. Um, but just knowing, not knowing the long-term health implications of COVID-19, especially for young children who are infected, seeing the rise in hepatitis cases um, that uh, some reports are now linking to, in, in pediatric hepatitis cases that are, some reports are linking to COVID-19. And, and then of course, the financial and economic impacts of COVID-19. You know, not only myself as a young, as a wor working mother, um, are the stakes high in terms of life insurance and any other kind of future health insurance policy for me in the future based on, upon whether or not I can track COVID-19 based on whether or not, um, uh, I end up being a long COVID or long hauler, um, but we don't know yet know the repercussions on children. And, you know, I feel uh, as a mother, as a new mother, and as someone who represents thousands of new mothers in Arizona and can speak for millions of new mothers, um, of mothers of young children under five throughout this country, uh, what, what our government is doing or, and, and the lack of action is just, we are experiencing a mass disabling event. And I am just, I, I mean, you know, the Senate Republicans just opened an uh, ethics uh, investigation against my um, Senator husband, who's also in the same boat, um, uh, because we have stood our ground on demanding remote voting um, uh, when they could just provide that accommodation, literally with the snap of their fingers, they can give us permission to log into Zoom from home so we can cast our votes. Like that is how ridiculous and callous 
and cruel the system is. And then, and then at the same time and in the same breath, we, we look and we look at legislatures and we look at um, governing bodies across the country and we're like, huh, I wonder why women of young children don't run for office or don't stay in office once they have, once they give birth and have children. Um, you know, I, this was already a struggle and a crisis before COVID-19, um, but I'm just one of those people where I don't mess around with health. Um, I don't mess around with the fact that, you know, I, I, I've been very cautious. I, I haven't had uh, COVID-19. Um, so it's just, uh, it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating how the Repo Republicans have mismanaged the pandemic and we had an opportunity um, to really front and center the uh, very real necessity of um, providing remote work, of providing caregiving for families, but then the Democrats have been messing it up too. I mean, our U.S. senator um, uh, has decided to, our senior senator has decided to stand with the filibuster instead of helping families like mine, helping people who would actually benefit from the Build Back Better agenda, who would actually benefit and, and be able to participate and stay in the workforce with, with young infants and with newborns and with, and, and with young children in their household, um, if the government actually took the time to invest in our families instead of taking the time to invest the, in, the, in the billionaires who have corrupted our political system and bought off our politicians. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm over time, we have five minutes. So I, I think the last thing I'll say, because again, Republicans, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm not supposed to be overtly uh, partisan, but kudos to Michigan that they have a democratic governor so they can get some things done, but Republicans like control everything in Arizona still. Um, uh, so I'm, I've co-sponsored and sponsored legislation, including paid family medical leave. Uh, I've co-sponsored legislation to provide our state employees paid family and medical leave. Um, but you know, these, um, these self-proclaimed pro-lifers apparently just can't find room in the agenda to get these bills through and sign into law because they're too focused on um, shaming new parents for doing everything in their power to protecting themselves and their newborn from COVID-19. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to questions later on. Sorry for going over time. And thank you again for having me on this panel to give voice um, as a new mother trying to navigate um, the health and safety of working in, in a COVID-19 uh, environment. Not a single apology necessary, Representative Salmon. Thank you so much for sharing so much of your personal experience and your legislative experience and how those are, um, you know, part and parcel of the same thing. Um, yes, please drop your questions for any of our speakers so far in the Q&A function. Um, I'm excited to introduce next a Maryland delegate who is the only biologist with an advanced degree in the state legislature. That is a fun fact that I love about her. Um, so please welcome Dele Maryland State Delegate Julie Polakovich carr Thank you so much. Great to be here with everyone. Uh, on this important topic. So I am Julie Polakovich Carr. I have the pleasure of uh, being one of the representatives for the third and fourth largest cities in Maryland. Uh, my district is located just in the outskirts of uh, Washington, DC. And I've served um, about four years in the Maryland House of Delegates. And I'm the proud mom of a seven-year-old who is in first grade. Um, you know, I think my family's story during the pandemic probably tracks with a lot of people's and stories that we've heard from other legislators. Tonight, my son was in nursery school in uh, the spring of 2020, and when the pandemic hit, his school closed. He didn't go back in person um, until about a year later, so he, he did most of his uh, year of kindergarten virtually, and uh, as folks know, that's, that's really tough to juggle, um, you know, helping a pre-literate child be on a computer all day long, and your own work, and being a state legislator, so I'll say I'm one of the millions of parents who uh, made the decision to voluntarily leave the workforce because of the demands on my family um, in terms of supporting my child through, through virtual schooling. But I think the stories we've heard tonight, and I'll say my own personal experience of being in office really reinforces for me the need to have more parents and more caregivers serving in elected office at, at all levels of government. Um, our personal experiences uh, really do influence um, how we as policymakers approach the job and especially what subjects um, you know, we champion on that we lend our names to and that we want to work on um, while in office. And we've heard some great examples of legislation tonight. I actually just want to talk about uh, two bills that I've worked on in, in recent years that are, I think, important for supporting caregivers and actually could be um, good models for in other states. 
Uh, so the first one is actually about electing more caregivers and more parents of kids into office. Um, it's hard enough to run for office, uh, you know, just in general to be a candidate. But if you have caregiving responsibilities, it makes it even tougher. Um, I ran for office twice while my son was very little, first when he was an infant, and then um, again when he was a toddler. And thankfully, in my own family situation, um, I had someone who could watch him while I was out knocking doors for hours and hours every week. But that isn't everyone's situation uh, personally, and they need to pay for a babysitter or to pay for a caregiver for an aging parent who lives with them. Um, and one of the things that I've been working on is to make sure that candidates in that situation, if they choose, can use their campaign funds to pay for their dependent care. Um, so far, 26 states allow this in some form, but I'll say that you know there's a lot of room for improvement even among states that have allowed it. For instance, in Maryland, where I'm from, um, our state board of elections issued a rule several years ago saying that um, campaign funds could be used for babysitting. So if you have an adult dependent, say a, an adult child who has a disability or an aging parent, um, that isn't eligible currently under, under those um, rules. So I, I'll say that I think that's a great issue that in pretty much every state there's room for improvement on or to even just have a baseline policy. And I would definitely advocate for, for others to lead the charge on that. Um, the second issue that I want to highlight is also financial in nature, but a little bit different, and that's um, child tax credits. I think most of us are probably familiar with the very successful program um, that President Biden um, led the charge on and became law in, in 2021 that uh, passed Congress to expand the federal child tax credit. And that program, um, because of the enhanced payments, um, as well as the wider eligibility for that program, uh, has been really successful at helping to lift uh, families with kids out of poverty. And in fact, some recent uh, studies have, have found that about 3.7 million kids were kept out of poverty because of those increased child tax credit payments from the federal government um, during 2021. Um, however, the bad news is, is that program, of course, um, was a one-year program. It was temporary. And so we've kind of reverted back to the existing federal child tax credit, uh, which isn't as, a, as much money um, it's not the monthly payments, and in fact, it excludes a number of, of kids and families. Um, the very lowest income families are totally kept out. Uh, families, even with into the middle income range, only receive a partial credit, and uh, kids who don't have a social security number are not eligible. But thankfully, this is an issue that states uh, can address. Uh, Maryland is one of nine states now that has passed um, their own uh, state supplemental uh, child tax credit. And I led that legislation along with Senator Nancy King um, it, about a year and a half ago, we got that passed. So I think that's another issue of, of where it's a great policy for states to work on. And I think it's something that we can be advocating for that really will help um, families and, and families with kids uh, to make end meet, ends meet and, and you know meet their needs. So I'll say that I think both these issues have the potential to be bipartisan in nature. Um, that certainly has played out in a number of states where they've passed. And if anyone wants to learn more about that or, or get additional resources, I'll drop my contact information in the chat and I'm happy to, to share you know, what I know and, and to provide resources. But thanks again. Thank you so much, Delegate. That was um, great. And um, your offer to share resources is super generous. So thank you. Um, our next panelist, um, our, the fourth, um, last but certainly not least in our panel of state legislators, um, is a Tennessee State Senator Ramesh Akberry, um, who's going to talk about her own experience um, in pushing for strong caregiving policies um, and more. And I will remind our group again, we are um, nonpartisan entities. Um, and um, I appreciated Marilyn Delegate talking about some, some of these are bipartisan in some states. I'm not sure if Tennessee is one of those states, um, but would love to hear more. And we'll turn it over to the state senator now. Well, thank you so much and so happy to join uh, you all and to see some of my uh, colleagues and friends in other legislatures. Uh, so I was elected to the Tennessee House in 2013. I was 29 and I was the youngest member at the time, uh, probably the only woman of childbearing years. Um, I'm now 38 and fortunately I'm no longer the youngest. I have a colleague in the Senate, she just joined me in the Senate, London Lamar, 
and she is, I believe, 33. Uh, but it is very difficult as someone who wants to start a family or who has a family uh, to, to go and serve in the General Assembly. I mean, January through April, we are in Nashville. So we leave our home uh, four days a week. Uh, so it certainly can be difficult, but that's kind of why I ran for office because I wanted to, to show that people in my age group and younger have something to say, have our unique life experiences and that those experiences can shape really good policy for our state. So I think Kelly mentioned uh, things being bipartisan. I'll tell you a little bit about um, our governor who is a Republican, I'm a Democrat, I'm in the minority party. Um, he announced it was a big deal in 2020 that he was going to have paid family leave for all state employees. Now I was super excited, could not wait to sign on and co-sponsor that legislation. And his party in the House and the Senate wouldn't go for it. They would not approve it. The fiscal note was not even that significant. It would allow those who had given birth, those who were caregivers for sick family members. I mean, it would have totally changed the dynamic for our state employees. And it unfortunately just, I mean, usually when the governor proposes something and it's in his budget, uh, that's something that is, is usually that moves forward and it didn't. So that was one of those kind of disappointing uh, things. Tennessee also has um, our TANF dollars, the, ten, the Temporary Assistance for Needy Families uh, dollars. We have the largest surplus in the entire country. I think at one point we were almost at a billion dollars in a surplus. Uh, we are not providing the services that families need to be able to take care of themselves. And to, you know, if you are having a rough time to be able to fill in the gap um, fortunately, there's a, a, a grant program that we've proposed where you have other groups like the United Way, like Boys and Girls Club, um, that are trying to fill in those gaps and will receive funding to do so. Trying to get creative around what does it mean to support a family and to support parents in those, in those family units. Something that I, I was a co-sponsor on that we tried to pass, again, Tennessee has multitudes of child care deserts. And I'm sure a lot of um, legislators on this call also probably deal with some of those issues as well. But you have some areas where there simply is no option. And if a parent or guardian wants to work, they have no opportunity for their child to, to be in any sort of care where, uh, where they will be allowed, they'll able to work so they won't have to care for the child during the day. And so we propose legislation to just start with um, our state employees at the bare minimum. Let's try and link childcare at some of our state facilities, especially in these rural areas where that the state might be the biggest employer and you have these childcare deserts. Uh, it's ongoing, it's ongoing battle. You know, honestly, I tell my colleagues, I said, look, you're if you're pro-life, that is from the womb to the tomb. So when those babies grow up and they are school age or their toddlers and they need to be able to have the resources and the family members need to have the resources to take care of their kids. Um, you, you have to fund those initiatives. You have to provide that level of support. And it's not like the state doesn't have the money. We, um, I don't know if other states are dealing with this, but we have had a budget that in the last three years has gone from 33 billion a year to 52 billion a year. Our rainy day fund is so full that it's just, I mean, it's, it's the largest it's ever been. And I told my colleagues, I said, listen, you guys are saving this money for a rainy day, but for some people it's been pouring, it's a monsoon. So yes, we have a surplus, but that's because you've made that surplus on the backs of underfunding these state programs. And you know, at some point it's going to reach a tipping point. A lot of my colleagues complain and say, well, people just don't wanna work. They don't wanna get in the workforce. That's why we have this labor shortage. No, it's because they, Families do not have the support that they need. They don't have the childcare options that they need. They don't have the caregiving support. If you are, if you get pregnant and you're working in one of these labor intensive jobs where they have no benefits, um, you are not going to be able to care for your family and work at the same time. And if you have an option to do that or to work at a restaurant or a, hospital, a hotel or something like that, 
but you have a job that will provide those benefits, of course, you're going to take it. So do not be upset that you are not able to employ your service industry when you're not providing what that employee needs. So it is a constant battle. Certainly, um, like I said, I'm not the youngest legislator anymore. I have a lot more gray hair. I actually have a gray eyelash on each eye. I didn't even know that was a possibility. Um, but as I've you know, learned and, and, and kind of gained some seniority in the legislature, that's certainly a fight uh, that, that I've been engaging in. And I do hope, especially around these conversations around Roe v. Wade and around formula shortages and what it really means to give a family the tools they need to be successful, that we lean into that. Because again, I love the quote. I, one of my colleagues and, and friends in Texas shared with me, if you care about children and you care about families, that's from the womb to the tomb. So don't say you're pro-life if you're not going to support that child once they're born and not support that family once they're born. Uh, so I will conclude there. I'm a lawyer and a legislator. So, you know, you have to cut me off. Uh, but just know, even in these, these deeply partisan times where it seems that, you know, if, if at some point I felt we could rely on the judicial branch to help us. And now I just feel like we're getting kicked in the teeth every day. But in these deeply partisan times, you do have legislators that are willing to reach across the aisles to do what's best for families and to put people and policy over politics. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love that. Um, folks, let's get your questions in. They're starting to populate in the chat and in the Q&A function. Let me kick us off with one. Um, we, you know, we heard some great personal stories from our legislator panel here and um, obviously deeply connected to um, to their policymaking work too. I would love, I think we have a question coming in asking each, any and all of our legislator panel, um, what do you need as a legislator when you are pushing for um, a bill that you are working on? Is it more effective for you to get from your constituents personal stories and situations or facts and figures? Um, what do you rely on when you're trying to lobby your colleagues to support one of your bills, right? Is it, is it how important are stories, um, personal stories, I think is the, the baseline question here. Um, I'm gonna see whichever one of you wanna come off camera first and take a stab. Wonderful, delegate, go for it. Yeah, great question. And I'll say, I think every legislature is a little bit different. In Maryland, um, we're fortunate to actually, like I have a full-time person who works for me during the session, only during the session. And we do have nonpartisan staff as part of our Department of Legislative Services who can kind of help with facts and figures types of research. So I often find that I and my staff have that covered, but it's those personal stories that are often hardest to get and especially to get someone who's willing to sign up and to share their story um, and to testify at a bill hearing is often really tough to find the, the right people to come and to speak for that who are willing to do so. And I'll, I'll be honest, oftentimes because it's really hard to do. Thankfully in Maryland, um, our hearings have been virtual at least on the House side the last two years. Um, that may change with next session, but certainly before the pandemic, it was a big ask for people to, to drive across the state and to spend you know half a day or a full day in Annapolis waiting to testify. But those stories really are key um, because people, my colleagues need to know, oh, this is a real problem that's impacting real Marylanders. Thank you. Anyone else from our legislator panel want to take um, take that question? How important are stories to you? I think it's great for our listeners here to to hear that um, you don't necessarily have to be an expert on every policy you're working for, right? You just need to be somebody who cares about something that's trying to get something done. Uh, Representative Selman, I saw I saw your hand up. Uh, yeah, thank you. I I I, I want to echo what the delegate said about the the facts and figures. Uh, we also have we we have both partisan and nonpartisan staff, but nonpartisan staff in Arizona works for the majority party. Um, but, but our partisan staff is able to get those facts and figures. Uh, when it comes to moving the majority party, which uh, a lot of what um, uh, the, the other uh, legislators on the panel talked about in some of these states where government agencies are just underfunded, um, every, any time that we've actually moved the needle and forced the majority party to actually invest in families, a huge component of that has been personal stories and it has been 
like unrelenting lobbying one-on-one -on -one meetings. So making sure that that constituents are meeting with um, the legislators of both parties, but especially the majority party doing press conferences, letter to the editors, op-eds, um, and really leading with those personal stories. Um, and, and then, you know, I mean, it's kind of unfortunate that we're at a place in our country where we govern by, by crisis and trauma, but in the event that there is a policy that would have alleviated or saved a life. Um, that is also something that I've seen in Arizona, you, kind of tangentially related, but for a decade, we were like um, trying to pass uh, um, a ban on texting while driving. We were like one of the last states to, to actually enact a ban. Um, and the impetus to finally um, get the majority party to get off their butts and do something, uh, a police officer had, had died um, uh, on duty while doing his job by someone who was distracted by texting. And even then the family had to relentlessly tell their story over and over and over again, work with the press, shame the majority party to do the bare minimum. Um, but without that personal story and without making that connection of what the policy, why the policy is so important, um, uh, you know, and at least in, in a state like mine, um, it's, it's even more difficult to try and make the case that this is something that should be done. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from um, Amelia in the Q&A, and I think um, the question comes down to whether any of you could talk about if you know of a, uh, any programs in your state around um, uh, supporting quote unquote non-traditional college students uh, make sure that they are able to uh, return to the classroom there, even if they have caregiving responsibilities, right, which so many do. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any examples of anything around supporting um, college students. Okay, great. Senator Ackberry, go for it. Uh, so we have something in Tennessee called the Tennessee Reconnect. Um, any person over the age of 24 that wants to attend community college or trade school, the state of Tennessee will pay that tuition. Um, so I think that kind of helps folks. And the good thing is most of these institutions offer online coursework. And so if the person is not able to, you know, leave their house or they still want to be able to learn in, um, and, and be able to work towards a degree, they can do that. Also, some of our community colleges, the largest community college, which is a state school in Memphis, has a child care facility on its grounds. Um, so that's a pretty neat feature uh, that's offered as well. And I know that there are organizations, nonprofits that help provide support and grants around that as well. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, Amelia, I don't know if you want to chat in what state you're in. I think um, the the exciting part is that it's, it's clear there are models in other places. Oh, New York. Okay, great. So I'd love to um, follow up with you. I'm going to just chat my email in here. Um, we, of course, work with a lot of New York state legislators, so I'd love to see if there's um, something like that that can be helpful to you. Please feel free to give me an email, Amelia. Um, wonderful. We have a couple of questions that are along the same theme, and I'd, I'd love each of our legislator panels to take this. Senator Chang, I'm going to start with you, so I'm going to queue you up. Um, but really, the question is, what or how is the best way um, that you as a state legislator can kind of support your constituents? What do you need from them? Um, what, it, you know, what is the best way they can contact you or, or work with you when you're trying to get something done or they have a policy idea? Like really what, what are the things that you need from your constituents to be an effective legislator? Yeah, thanks. I mean, any and all ways is fine. I mean, I for me, I uh, love hearing from our residents um, by email, by phone is fine. You know, we have been doing over the pandemic uh, sort of like a mix of virtual coffee hours where we stream them on Facebook Live and then people like put in their questions and comments and we respond to them that way. That's another great way because then you can like hear us share updates and then um, put in your own questions and ideas and comments and we love that. Um, and we've So we've been doing a mix of virtual events mixed with uh, in-person things as we, you know, some of them even outside. Um, so I definitely think that, you know, face-to-face -face or with virtual 
um, as close to face to face as you can get is also super, it's probably the best way. Um, but then, uh, you know, email and phone is also good. Um, we, with, I think social media kind of just depends on the legislator. Um, so like I will see stuff on Twitter faster than I'll see things on Facebook Messenger. I just honestly am really bad at Facebook Messenger. Um, and then, you know, so it just kind of depends on the person um, as far as like what people are checking and actually responding to. Um, so I definitely, in terms of like um, calling versus social media or email, I, I think email and uh, calling is definitely more effective. Um, but, you know, I agree with what folks said earlier about sharing personal stories, data, information, and even like ideas that people have. Because they're um, some of the best thing bills that I've introduced or um, some of the bills that I've even gotten done have come directly from people in my district coming to say, here's what we're facing. We need your help coming up with, you know, a solution and then actually working uh, through ideas and research hand in hand with our residents is uh, one of the most amazing experiences and we love that. Um, so, you know, sometimes I feel like people maybe feel like they have to contact a lawmaker with a specific bill number or a specific thing. Um, you can come to us with anything, you know, if it's even just a vague idea that you might have that you need help figuring out or a problem that you're seeing that you want us to, you know, help dig through. Um, you know, we love that. So definitely we love hearing from our residents. Fantastic, thank you. Also, yes, Facebook Messenger, the worst. Difficult to not anyway. <laughs> Wonderful, I think the takeaway is that you all, good state legislators, you're online, you're accessible, right? You know that as part of your job. And so um, you are, are you know easy to find and engage with. And I think that is the takeaway that I, I, I'd love every participant to be able to have. Um, Google your legislator and then find where they are and meet them there and build a relationship. I think we are um, coming close to time. I also think I missed a poll question. Um, USOW team, do we wanna launch that final poll question? Um, I'd love to hear what actions have our participants already taken on um, on caregiving policy? Have you uh, worked with um, your member of Congress and asked them to do something? Um, I'm thinking of that, um, you know, formula shortage vote that we just saw. Um, have you emailed or called a state legislator about a bill? Have you just, you know, shared information, hugely important, shared something um, on, you know, your own social media page, whether it's a news article about a topic or a call to action? Have you even just talked to your friends and family? Um, that's usually, uh, you know, step number one. Um, something else or nothing yet. So let's just take another couple of seconds for that. Um, we have about half. Yes, all good steps to take for sure. Great. Okay, let's share our results and see what we have. Um, it looks like a lot of people have done at least something, which is fantastic. So huge round of applause. Um, and I think talking to friends and family, so again, a great, great step number one. Um, and from there, a really easy transition to some of these other actions to, um, to talk to lawmakers at any level about the role that they can play. Fantastic, keep it up. Okay, with that, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Paloma. I'm gonna say a huge thank you to our state legislative superstars um, for really being on those front lines at the state houses, um, fighting for our, our rights and our values. We deeply appreciate and admire you. So thank you. Um, with that, Paloma. Thank you, Kelly. And a big thank you to all of our legislators. We really appreciate you all spending some time with us today. Um, as we've heard, there is power in storytelling. Um, it's one of the ways that we've seen that legislators have been able to move on issues. And even if we don't think so right now, I promise you that we all have a story to tell um, and we're gonna help you share it. So next Wednesday, the 25th, a supermajority will be hosting a personal narrative training. Um, it's gonna be led by our leadership and development team. They will lead us in crafting our personal story as a way to move folks to action. Um, and there will be an opportunity to practice and receive feedback. So join up, um, sorry, so sign up um, by the sign up on the link that should be dropped in the chat box right now. Um, and again, that's gonna be next Wednesday, the 25th. Um, join us to learn how to share your personal story as a way to organize. 
Um, and I think that we have one um, final poll question. We want to hear from you all. Like, we're going to continue to do these state of play events, and we want to hear from you what other topics you think we should cover. Um, so we're going to share that poll now. Um, we have everything from abortion access, paid and family leave, pay equity, housing, voting rights, and democracy protection, education, schools, and student debt, healthcare, climate justice, all of the above, <laughs> also an option. Um, please let us know what you would like to hear um, from us. We're going to continue to engage state legislators across the country in these important conversations and would love for you to help inform that. So we're just going to give it a few more seconds so folks can answer. So we're about 50% right now. So if you have an opportunity, please um, go ahead and vote in our poll. All righty, we have some, some strong contenders here. So um, I'm not sure if we wanna leave it up a little bit longer and we can share um, the poll results in just a second. Great, so I think we're um, good to go ahead and share those results now. Um, so it looks like there are some that are coming out in front. We see folks um, obviously very interested in abortion access following the leak, um, paid and family leave, voting rights and democracy protection, and then education, schools, and student debt. And I feel that uh, student debt won very strongly. So thank you all again for voting and for joining us today. Um, we appreciate it and a big thank you to the state legislators uh, for joining us. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon.